The Eiffel Tower today is very much the symbol of Paris, and so it was in World War II. It became intertwined in the story of wartime Paris, from the German capture of the City of Light in 1940 to its liberation in 1944. Nearly dismantled or even blown up on several occasions during the war, the Eiffel Tower's ultimate survival was, ironically, due to a German officer. In summer 1940, Hitler had struck west. He had defeated Poland in a lightning campaign in September to October 1939, then marshaled his forces for the attack on Germany's traditional opponent, France. Attacking through Belgium and the Netherlands, French forces and the British expeditionary force were drawn north, where the great bulk of the Allied armies were trapped when Hitler unleashed a fresh offensive through the Ardennes forest, which the Allies thought unsuitable for tanks. The British expeditionary force began its painful withdrawal to Dunkirk, while Hitler's Panzer forces smashed through French resistance and captured Paris on the 14th of June 1940. There was no fighting in the city. The French government had declared Paris an open city to prevent damage, and German forces quickly moved to occupy important buildings and monuments. Naturally, the Eiffel Tower was a priority target, and not just for symbolic reasons. The tower served a useful military purpose as well. Constructed for the 1889 World's Fair, the Eiffel Tower stands 324 meters, or 1,063 feet tall, and was the world's tallest structure until the completion of the Chrysler Building in New York City in 1930. It has three levels, each connected by stairs and lifts. Because of its great height, the Eiffel Tower was utilized for scientific experiments from its inception. Radio was one area pursued by scientists. The French army took an interest in using the tower for wireless transmission experiments, and by 1913, the tower could send telegrams using electrical waves all the way to the United States and to ships crossing the Atlantic, up to 6,000 kilometers from Paris. It really proved valuable in September 1914, during the Battle of the Marne, during World War I. The radio station operators were able to listen in and decipher German army communications, information about the enemy's plans that led to a French victory at the Marne and saving Paris from the Germans. With the advent of television, the Eiffel Tower again was important. In 1935, a TV studio was set up, and the Eiffel Tower TV transmitter started beaming a television signal to Parisians. Who mostly could watch in special TV cafes, not dissimilar to modern internet cafes. As the German army once more threatened Paris in June 1940, the French army decided to take steps to make capturing the Eiffel Tower more difficult. The army ordered the tower's director Etienne Marc to completely destroy the lift systems at the same time as they wrecked the radio equipment at the top. But Director Mark could not bring himself to vandalize such an important landmark, and he only ordered the lift cables cut and some electrical switches smashed, enough to ensure that the Germans never operated a single lift in the tower during the occupation. On the 14th of June 1940, a small unit of German troops decided to conquer the Eiffel Tower. Carrying with them a huge German army battle flag, they climbed the 1,710 steps to the top, filmed for propaganda purposes. The first flag raised actually blew away two hours later, and the stunt was repeated with a smaller flag. Hitler himself paid a flying visit to the Eiffel Tower on the 23rd of June 1940. He did not set foot on the actual tower and was apparently annoyed that the lifts had been immobilized, but instead viewed the tower from afar, having his photograph taken, just like millions of other tourists before and since. The Germans were much enamored of the Eiffel Tower, its name reminiscent of the Eiffel region of western Germany that abuts the Belgian Ardennes forest. 
However, the German Ministry of Armaments demanded the tower be torn down for scrap. It did, after all, contain 7,300 tons of wrought iron. But the Reichspost, a part of the propaganda ministry, interceded and convinced Dr. Goebbels of the tower's value for propaganda purposes. The TV station was put back into service as a conduit for pro-German propaganda programs beamed from the top of the Eiffel Tower. The tower itself also became a symbol of Nazi propaganda, and ironically also a symbol of hope of liberation. On the tower's second stage, a huge V for victory had been installed by the French before the tower was captured. The Germans left the V in place, using the symbol as their own sign for victory, alluding to the word Victoria, or the Roman goddess of victory, instead of an S for the German word Sieg for victory. Below the V was a huge banner that read Deutschland siegt auf allen Fronten, or Germany victorious on all fronts. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill wittily observed that the V actually stood for the German word verloren, or defeat, and the French resistance went about defacing the German slogan, which was found hanging not only on the Eiffel Tower, but was painted all over occupied France. By changing one letter, it would read as follows. Deutschland liegt auf allen Fronten, which means Germany lie on every front line. During the occupation of Paris, only Germans could climb the tower at a charge of one franc each instead of the pre-war ten francs per person. It was enormously popular with off-duty German soldiers. It seems obvious that the Germans would emplace flak guns on the Eiffel Tower. They would not be the first to do so. The French had installed a small gun on the third floor in 1889, and it was fired every day at 6pm to let visitors know that the tower was about to close. A noonday gun was fired from the second floor every day between 1900 and 1914. During World War I, the French army had set up a few anti-aircraft machine guns on the tower, but the Germans never bothered. The reason? Without functioning lifts, moving equipment, ammunition and supplies was just too much hassle. Instead, the base of the Eiffel Tower was ringed with machine guns, anti-tank guns and barbed wire. However, by the summer of 1944, the writing was clearly on the wall for the German occupation of France. Following the D-Day landings in June in Normandy and the Dragoon landings in southern France in August, the German army had fought hard but then broken and retreated steadily back towards the borders of the Reich with American, British, Canadian, Polish and Free French forces in hot pursuit. Hitler ordered the German commandant of Paris, General Dietrich von Koltitz, to enact a policy of demolishing Paris landmarks in a cynical attack on French culture, but the embattled Koltitz refused to carry out such an order. As sporadic fighting took place in the city, as free French forces fought trap pockets of German troops, on the 25th of August 1944, a small group of French firefighters and some men from the French Naval Museum, both carrying homemade French flags, climbed to the top of the Eiffel Tower. As they climbed, they actually came under rifle and machine gun fire from German troops surrounded in buildings below. But the museum staff made it first, and tore down the German flag from the top of the Eiffel Tower, putting up the French tricolore in its place. Shortly after, General von Koltitz surrendered, and Paris was saved. Shortly afterwards, a U.S. Army Signals Detachment climbed to the top and established a radio station to enable secure communications with the Channel ports and the American, British and French forces east and southeast of Paris. As the front line moved away from Paris, the Eiffel Tower became once again a popular destination for tourists, this time U.S. soldiers on leave. The tower's director oversaw repairs to the lifts, and by 1946 they were once again operational. Please subscribe, share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. Details in the description. You can also help support both of my channels through PayPal and Patreon. Details again in the description box. Music